Pokemon Sleep is probably the best Pokemon spin-off game to be released in the last 50 years. I should know. Look at all these shinies I got. But it does have one fatal flaw. The Pokemon can't battle each other. So today, I'll be fixing that by recording my sleep encounters for two weeks and adding them to my Pokemon X save to do a hardcore Nuzlocke. I'll be adding two of them at a time for each gym leader to ease them into the game. The first morning arrives and I get some pretty good starting choices with Growlithe and Slowpoke and Wobbuffet, but I've got to go with Mareep, who fits the sleep aesthetic the best. And yes, this one already had some Pokey Biscuits before, but I can't help that I'm so good at this game. <laughs> On day two, I get some solid choices, but the one I want most is Doduo. Sadly, after one Daily Biscuit and one Pokey Biscuit, Doduo becomes full. In order to catch these Pokemon, you need to feed them enough to fill up their bar. But they might only eat two Biscuits a day, which means I won't be getting every Pokemon that I want. Next, I'll try... Cubum. Oh. Oh, hi, Chloe. <laughs> I use a Great Biscuit to get some bonus hearts just in case they're not that hungry. What? <laughs> what is it? And then after the next Pokey Biscuit, they're full. I could get the Marowak, but since it's evolved and almost full already, that'd feel a little bit like cheating. So I guess I'll just get the Geodude. Now I finally load up the game to choose Helix Midnight as my starter, and immediately head to the PC to grab Winkbed. With my first two tired Pokemon at my side, we challenge ourselves to the first gym. And unsurprisingly, it's a pretty easy fight. Surf Skid outspeeds the Helix to land a bubble, but takes massive damage from Thundershock in return. They heal up the damage only to get it right back, and then use one last quick attack before going down to another Thundershock. Vivillon is next, and Helix would probably be fine here, but I want to give Winkbed some attention and switch her in. The tackle does almost no damage, but the following infestation is honestly a little scary. Winkbed lands their first rollout, which does about 70%. And instead of spamming infestation, they just use Harden? which lets us land another rollout, winning us the first badge. I wake up on morning 3 in Pokemon Sleep to many Pokemon, but most importantly, a Heracross. I knew it'd be a long shot, but I had to go for it. My best bet is a critical biscuit activating, but this Pokemon also gets full after just two bites. Nice. Well, Ghastly would be cool, so I use a Great Biscuit again, which are more expensive and harder to get, by the way. <laughs> but this one gets full right away, too. This is so unlucky. Okay, Swallowed is okay. I'm just gonna keep using Great Biscuits to guarantee this and... Oh, come on! Who does that leave me? Uh, okay, cool. Psyduck is fine. Nice to meet you, Zinus Green Tea. For the fourth day, I was feeling a little desperate and slapped on a friend incense that would make sure at least one Pokemon would be easy to get. Unfortunately, the options kinda suck. Squirrel is hungry for some biscuits, but I already have a water type. And I know Magneton is not happening. Cubone is back, but now that I have Wink Bed, I'm just gonna get the Iggly buff. Entering Lumio City now honestly makes me really excited for Pokemon Legends Z to A. I'm pretty sure this is still the biggest city in all of Pokemon as is, and you're telling me we're gonna get a game that'll be the scope of the Smash Bros stage? We just might get Pokemon GTA before GTA 6. I just hope the camera is better. There's a lot of game before the following gym fight that I'm not mad at, to be honest and it leads me to a Snorlax blocking my way. That should be me right now. To wake it up, I head over to the Parfum Palace. And you know what? This place seems to have a lot of connection to Gen 5 and Unova. I wouldn't be surprised if Legend Z to A expands on that. Reshiram? <laughs> and as usual, I can't help myself and run into an optional trainer on the way to a TM that I never use. This area is known for the Furfuro double battle that ends runs, but apparently no one has ever heard of the most elusive Volbeat in France. Zynus leads in this matchup only to be immediately confused. Luckily, our water gun does land, but it does so little that I switch into Winkbed. Rollout would have made this fight end in a flash, but another Confuse Ray gets my rock to hurt herself in confusion. Fullbeat sets up their first double team, and Winkbed gets another confusion hit. Yikes. The confusion is what's doing most damage to us, so we keep trying as they set up another double team. Just to miss the rollout. Since the confusion terrifies me now, I go to Helix and she takes a little too much from Tackle. Before we can land our Thundershock, another Confuse Ray lands and procs. This is going horribly. We do land the Thundershock through another double team next turn, but it doesn't do enough. And then they do another double team, and we get another hit of Confusion. Then, my worst nightmare is realized. 
This thing has moonlight and undoes all of our work so far. Helix is able to land a huge thunder wave, but I'm in for it now. From here I try some other strategies, like getting Zynus to land a confusion to get them confused. But since they're so elusive and we just became confused, I go back to Winkbet again to try to land Rollout. The first one does land, but isn't enough. And we miss every following attempt. Only to get confused again. Dream Cloud comes out and uses Return after another heal. And it does over half. Dang. Sadly, we do need a switch, so Zynus comes back and attacks, only for them to heal again. Well, they're gonna run out at some point, right? Zynus finally ends up landing a Disable, but only Disables Tackle. Pretty soon, my team ends up looking like this from a Volbeat. It's pretty clear that I just need to send it and hope for the best at this point. Winkbed takes a final stand and eats a Tackle. If she gets confused and hurts herself in confusion here, she'll only be one more Tackle away from the end. The Volbeat has set up six double teams, but all we need to do is land one rollout to get out of this fight. With the whole run riding on this, Weakbed pulls through and lands a rollout, defeating the tourist's Volbeat. And all that for what TM, you may ask? Well, <laughs> Venishok. I finally wake up the Snorlax, and this guy is actually nowhere near as difficult as the Volbeat. After Helix paralyzes him, Winkbed tanks everything he's got and finishes the fight from there. After getting through Glittering Cave, uh, what, what kind of fossil is that? After getting through Glittering Cave, I begin my trek through the Silage Gym. Well, not before checking out the clothes shop. The guy clothes really aren't great, huh? Guess I'll go Shaggy mode. <sighs> there are a few close calls in the gym, with some of the gym trainers seeming like they were made to be harder than the leader. But we make it to the top, largely unharmed. In this challenge, I'll be matching the Pokemon count to the Gym Leaders and Elite Four, so once again, only two Pokemon will be brought to the fight. But with Winkbed evolved, I'm not worried at all. Well, I'm a little worried about the Amara, which is why I lead with Zynus instead. Her Water Pulse does just under half before we get paralyzed, but the Aurora Beam does almost nothing as our next Water Pulse makes Grant use his Hyper Potion. But Zynus is doing an amazing job not getting fully parried, and lands another Water Pulse. Their Ice-type takedown then does a little more than I'd like, while Water Pulse just barely misses the kill again, even with their recoil. Now, thanks to our Orenberry, even a crit takedown won't be the end of our little duck. As long as she doesn't get paired this turn, we'll be alright. And she doesn't! Zynus Green Tea lands the hit, knocking out the Yamara. Tyrant enters the field, and even though it would be a swift end to Zynus, Winkbed is more than sturdy enough to eat any of their hits. We then narrowly escape what I can only assume to be the nastiest bite flinch combo chain in history to land a magnitude 10, which is more than enough to one-shot Tyrant. While I get the next Pokemon Sleep Encounter, I'd like to note real quick that it took until this day for me to get used to recording this. Every morning up until this one, I was waking up in a sweat up to 3-4 to four hours before my alarm, worried that I'd forget to hit the record button or something. Don't play Pokemon Sleep for the sleep tracking, guys. Well, the encounters for today are mostly more of the same. And Rattata. So Bellsprout ends up being my best choice. Miraculously, I get her, and name her Birch Natural. Birch Natural is honestly a pretty decent encounter, because Karina is blocking my next one. She has two Lucarios, who would decimate my team otherwise. They're still very likely to, but after the fully evolved Birch paralyzes the first Lucario, she brings it very low with some Leaf Tornadoes. Birch could finish off the Lucario, but we're too low and they have the priority faint. So instead of risking it, I go to Helix, who could take him out after taking a little damage. The second Lucario is a little more touchy now, but they waste a turn lowering our special defenses, even though they have no special attacks. Helix's Thunder Wave was boosting Electro Ball to be decently strong, and we end up barely winning the matchup from there. The Lucario started going for power-up punches, and if they simply led with that move, then this would have ended very differently. The sixth morning in Pokemon Sleep gives me some pretty great encounters. And Wobbuffet. But I'd be crazy not to go for Eevee. And it seems like it was meant to be, because the bonus biscuit gets a crit and snatches me Nola in one go. Aw, oh, look at her! I immediately decide on the Espeon route, because Espeon is the best evolution, and sneak my way through Reflection Cave to challenge Gym 3. For this fight, I was going to bring Zynus Green Tea, but he still can't evolve into Golduck with a level cap. I guess Golduck are just too strong. And you know who else is too strong? Nola the Espeon because she one-shots all of Karina's Pokemon. What? No way! 
The final morning of the first week is here, and this day is usually the best because Snorlax is at its strongest. And I get... <gasps> oh, he's so cute! Wait, is that Snorlax shiny? I end up getting the Charmander pretty easily and name her Temper. Before I have access to the next encounter, I realized I forgot to go to the top of the Tower of Mystery to get my Mega Bracelet and Mega Lucario. Well, Lucario dies in one hit and we won't be getting him, but I got the Mega Bracelet. And man, this game really puts the guilt trip on you if you don't take the Lucario. I actually feel kind of bad. But now I can get my 8th Pokemon, and for this week, I commit and use my good camp ticket. These things boost your Pokemon's output to help Snorlax attract Pokemon more easily, and it guarantees that at least one Pokemon will arrive hungry every day. I'm a free-to-play player, and I won't get too into the economy of the game, but just know I'm putting way more in-game currency into this than I honestly should. I did end up putting myself into a corner though, because this second week was the beginning of the Suicune event, which boosts water Pokemon spawns. Also, I allegedly only got almost 5 hours of sleep, but... Uh, Pokemon Sleep is more of a game than a sleep tracker, guys. It can only track so much. I try to get Riolu, but since he gets full in two biscuits, I just get Satfa the Totodile instead. Did I say that right? Sa Satfa? She sadly won't be used much at the Grass-type gym. Temper would be amazing on her own for this gym, but her evolution is two levels past the level cap, meaning she won't be carrying. As I approach Ramos and his iconic scissors, I realize that I just have a worse fit than him. Temper is my lead of choice and is able to live two of the Jump Bluff's acrobatics moderately well thanks to our held Eviolite, before getting the kill with Fire Fang. This baits out Go-Goat, who has Bulldoze. I wanted to bring Helix, who's an Ampharos now, but this guy is the reason I couldn't. Instead, Birch is the one that takes the hit and gets her speed lowered. Next turn they go for the takedown and... Oh my goodness! I was not expecting them to take that much damage. Well. I got a little cocky by this point in the game, and didn't want to think too much about Go-Goat's damage output. I knew it could be strong, but since I didn't have anyone better than Birch for this, I was hoping to simply get enough damage off with Acid, which is definitely not enough. Unfortunately, neither Temper nor Nola would be able to switch in and get the kill reliably, so Birch has to be the one to take the hit. There's a chance they missed the takedown, but it does land after all. Rest in peace, Birch. She just wanted to sleep and be silly. A fully healthy Nola switches in, and her Psybeam probably does the worst amount of damage, because after the Go-Go lowers her speed with Bulldoze, Ramos heals off all of the damage with a Hyper Potion. Our following Psybeam doesn't do much, but the next one crits! And even though Nola dodges the next takedown, that turn was a curse in disguise. Because Ramos heals AGAIN, and Nola soon gets hit with a second Bulldoze. If she didn't crit, I think she would've gotten out of this, but regrettably, the Go-Go now outspeeds us and gets another kill. Ugh, rest in peace, Nola. She just wanted to sleep and be silly. All I'm left with is Temper. She has an Eviolite, but even that probably wouldn't be enough to save her from a Bulldoze. She outspeeds here for sure, but it's just a matter of Flame Burst damage. If it doesn't get the kill, then the run is as good as over. We could Dragon Rage instead, but that's still a toss-up at this point. With everything stacked against her, Temper shoots off a Flame Burst, and Go Go goes down. Last is Weeping Bell, but the only one left to weep is me and Temper because he too goes down in one flame burst, winning us a surprisingly deadly badge four. Dang, he really stole my fit, did it better, broke my ankles, and killed two of my better Pokemon. Ramos truly is the most iconic character in X and Y. Morning Night gives me a Magnemite, and catching them is actually pretty straightforward. Not only that, but a few days later, I encounter a shiny one. Shinies always have a 100% capture rate, and I just use this one in place of the first. On morning 10, I was pretty out of it, and uh, ignore this weekend, and I get a crit biscuit with the pincer. Unfortunately, they still get full right away, but I had hope for a second. From there, I ignore the Quilava because I already have a fire type. I ignore the Ivysaur because I've used a couple in Nuzlocke recently, and then the Gulpin of all Pokemon gets full. I end up getting the Bellsprout because I forgot I had one already, so today's encounter is forfeited. That's what I get for playing this game when I wake up, I guess. Well, even though I can't use my cool new Charizard in the Electric Gym, things should still be a little easier here. Oh, oh, uh, my bad. When the gym battle starts, Winkbed returns to the run to tank a few hits from Momolga before knocking them out with a Smackdown Magnitude combo. Heliolisk tags in and the threat of Grass Knot forces me to switch to Zynus. I could have evolved Zynus at Route 9 apparently, but I guess I've learned nothing. 
We don't have much to hit them with, but our typing should be enough to wall them. A Thunderbolt crit proves me wrong, while Mirror Shot starts giving me flashbacks. I know Zynus lives with Thunderbolt if it doesn't crit, so we stay in to at least land a Supersonic. Next turn, I bring out Helix, while they just get hit with confusion. Yeah, that's what it feels like! Sorry. Helix takes advantage of this opportunity to launch a couple power gems to quickly take them down. Last is Magneton, and Helix confuses them as well before they set up the electric terrain. With our boosted longevity thanks to the Citrus Berry, Helix is able to do some damage and confuse them again. But they are clearly overpowering us. At this point, I make a crazy call and switch back to Wink Bed. On the switch, Magneton would have gone for Thunderbolt, but gets confused anyway. Then, on the following turn, they do it again, and Winkbed takes them down with magnitude, winning us another super easy gym badge. Yeah, I wasn't worried, actually. Let me just evolve Zynus real quick. Oh, and I just, I just now realized I named them the same thing as Golduck. Oops. The next morning, Pokemon Sleep, I get a few more decent options, and opt for the Larvitar. Tyranitar is around the corner and will be very useful. I can't say I'm as inspired by the variety on the next day, so I just get Chikorita. I must be sleeping wrong or something. Welcome in Titan Plus and Nectar. Ooh, I can finally upgrade my style. Uh, okay, sure, yeah. Too bad for Titan and Nectar, but I won't be using either of them for the Fairy Gym. Winkbed is once again my lead of choice and takes out the Mawile with little hassle. Sinus could have done the work to begin with, but again, I like to use all my Pokemon. Speaking of, Zynus deals with both the Mr. Mime and Sylveon with no trouble whatsoever. These games are so easy. With that badge over and done, I head back to Pokemon Sleep. This is actually the day the Shiny Magnemite spawns. Also, ignore the Suicune. Riolu is the only real option here, and somehow, it doesn't get full before I catch her. Wow! Welcome in, Aurora Lu. Lux? The following morning has pretty lackluster encounters, and I just get barely the Pseudo Wudo. This is the last encounter, by the way. That's two weeks of Pokemon, and from here on, I'll have to work with what I've got. And the stakes are certainly rising. Before I challenge the 7th Gym Leader, Frost Cavern opens up with a trainer with a level 46 Dewblade. Aurora does well enough for her very first fight, but Temper ends up coming in to save the day. Honestly, it's pretty nice to have Temper. She balances out the team really well. That proves to be the case up through the end of the cave, where I save an Abomasno from Team Flare. It rewards me with the Abomas Knight, which reminds me, I technically have the ability to Mega Evolve Helix, Temper, and Aurora whenever I want. Right now, my rule is that Mega Evolution is allowed whenever my opponent uses it. But since it's used so little in the game, I thought about rules like I can Mega Evolve in gyms if I bring one to two less Pokemon, but even that feels like a little bit much, since Megas are so strong. I don't know. Let me know what you guys think in the comments. I just hope Legends Z to A makes them feel nicer to use. After entering Anastar City, I change my outfit again to something that's... fine, and head over to the gym. The battle begins with Helix versus Sigilyph. They outspeed and set up a light screen, but Thunderbolt still looks like a two-hit KO. They follow the turn with a flimsy psychic, and we retaliate by knocking them out. Second up is Slowking, and our Thunderbolts aren't quite as strong. They set up a yawn, but since I know they're gonna go for it again, we stay in to paralyze them. Once Helix falls asleep, Shiny Zynus tags in, and their Thunderbolt is more than enough now that their light screen has run out. Finally, Meowstic is last, and this Pokemon was for sure meant to have a Mega Evolution. But without one, Zynus easily outdamages them, leaving us free to do the remaining 75% of Team Flare content. Up until this point, Team Flare has been way more present than Team Rocket in Gen 2, but is somehow only just as effective. They've been investigating and learning about Mega Evolution the entire time, but none of its five named admins can use it, even in the endgame. Man, don't get me wrong, I understand these games took a lot of effort to make, being the first mainline 3D Pokemon games, and the YouTube content surrounding the game was peak at the time, but these needed a third version. I think they were supposed to, but something went horribly wrong. Like, why would the anime be called XYZ? And did they really want to debut Zygarde's other forms in Sun and Moon? I don't know. We could skip the first line Sander fight because it's mostly the same as the second, in which he leads with Mian Shao, but Temper is here to save the day again. Honestly, without her, this thing would be doing some massive damage to my team. Luckily, we do have her, and her air slash lands, getting the one shot. Gyarados is next, and even without the Mega, it can be a problem. But Nectar is actually perfect for this matchup. She switches in on a resisted Aqua Tail, 
and before they can follow up, she sets up a reflect. As a result, Outrage doesn't do enough to us anymore, and Nectar just heals it back up with Synthesis. Once we're comfortable, we land a Body Slam that paras right away. And from here, it's a little bit of a stall war, but Nectar becomes a murderer. What does this mean for her as a Pokemon? Has the path of her life been dramatically changed? Will she be able to live with the consequences of this action? I don't know, I've got to switch to Satva on the Pyroar. She does in fact get burned by Fire Blast on the Switch, but it's still not enough and Surf barely gets the kill. Turning Zatva into a murderer. What does this mean for her as a Pokemon? Has the last is Honchkrow, but Shiny Zynus is the perfect match for them, and Lysander is soon temporarily defeated. The third and final battle against Lysander is pretty similar, but the added factor of Mega Gyarados does change a lot. The buffed attack stat means I can't rely on Nectar in the same way that I did before. I know Gyarados is always sent out last, but none of the other three Pokemon are safe for Nectar to get the screen up early. On top of that, the general bulk means that I don't really have a way to get a clean one-shot on the lobster. I only have so many Pokemon in this run, and every encounter counts, so I'm gonna have to use the ace up my sleeve that's finally allowed. Mega Evolution. Uh, oh, 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 I left the Mega Stone behind. Hey, guys. Hey, Lucario, you still want to join my team? Yeah, 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 well, welcome in. Lysander's Mega Evolution will be his own downfall, because now I can use it too. Aurora really does come into her own here, and on her first turn of Mega Evolution, she uses Protect. Gen 6 didn't have Dynamic Speed, so normally people did this to wait out the first turn of Mega, where the Pokemon still had its pre-Mega Speed. But instead, we're using it to eat their high jump kick and make them take recoil damage. Mianshell is crazy fast and would still outspeed my Mega, so next turn we take the kill with extreme speed. The same can't be said for the Pyroar and Honchkrow, who both do get outsped and easily one-shot by a massive close combat. The Gyarados enters the field and lowers Aurora's attack with Intimidate. But since they Mega Evolve and adopt the Dark Typing, close combat is still enough to get the kill and put an end to Lysander's reign. After the fight is said and done, because I'm playing Pokemon X instead of Pokemon Y, Lysander threatens everyone with... eternal life? Honestly, a pretty dark and weird outcome. That's kind of scarier than death, and now instead of Lysander dying under the rubble, he's alive, I guess? Is it eternal life as in you don't age? AZ is over 3,000 years old, but... Does he not, like, get sick? Could it be the eternal life where you're immortal and indestructible, or if you get crushed, are you just gonna be a sentient, crushed person? Anyways, hee <laughs> hee. Titan Plus joins the rotation on the squad and puts in work for the upcoming boss fights. Who would have thought? Specifically, I lead her into the 6v9 rival fight. She ends up taking noticeable damage from Delcaddy before one-shotting them with Brick Break. Gujar then comes out, proving that Shauna was just gaslighting when she said she was scared of the Team Flare admins. Temper tags in on the Earthquake and lands a fly on the Gudra since they're more specially defensive. A Dragon Pulse in return does a lot, but our held Citrus Berry will let Temper live another one, theoretically. Unfortunately, that theory is immediately put to the test, because the next fly ends up missing. Fortunately, that theory was true. <laughs> well, what are the odds we miss a second fly in a row? Just kidding, don't tell me! <laughs> I bet it was zero. With Delphox last, Satva switches in. She's still coping with becoming a murderer, I guess, because she doesn't get the job done before they set up Calm Mind. They would definitely get us before we get them, so Titan Plus comes back out to eat their hits and finish the job. Shauna's honestly a weird lead for this boss fight, because she always ends up being the hardest. For Tierno, Titan Plus one-shots the Talonflame, Nectar outwalls the Roserade since they only have Petal Dance, and Crawdon is just obliterated by Zynus. For Trevor, that's a little orange one by the way, Titan Plus deletes the Raichu, Zynus melts the Florges, mostly, and then does the same to the Aerodactyl. I wish I didn't have to say this about Wolfric, but he's somehow even easier. I mean, when he leads the fight with, I could be a total pushover, I, I guess it shouldn't be surprising. Obviously I have the perfect Pokemon to deal with his team, and Temper shows out by one-shotting all of the Ice-type Pokemon with Flamethrower. What? To be fair, she did get a crit on the Cryogonal, and I think that crit mattered, but oh well. This last section of the game is pretty straightforward, and the difficulty honestly culminates in Victory Road really well. However, with my team balance, and Titan Plus, oh my gosh, 
I'm able to steamroll most of the trainers. Even the rival! Remember her? Oops, no you don't. Moving on. But I do make a critical mistake toward the end. X and Y's victory road culminates in three difficult, mandatory trainers. I had an idea to look up their teams to prep for them beforehand, but didn't feel like it and charged in anyways. The first guy had a Trevenant that I feel like is min-maxed. Obviously the original Zionus isn't the answer, so I switched to Temper. But they use a curse on the switch. We could maybe kill with Flamethrower, but I'm not risking it and switch to Aurora Lu. They crit with Shadow Ball immediately, so I switch to Titan. On a Will-O-Wisp. He's seriously breaking my angles. Is this Ramos? For some reason I was impatient here and assuming Titan would outspeed, I lock in a Crunch. But somehow they outspeed Titan and get a clean kill with Woodhammer. This thing must be min-maxed because Titan has three levels and 15 base speed points on the Trevenant. From here, they're low enough to get killed by Zynus, and the following Gigalith isn't. But Zynus lives their Earthquake thanks to Sturdy and wins us the match. <laughs> You'd think I'd learn my lesson from this with only two trainers to go, but in fact, I do not. And look, I, I promise I'm not doing this for content. At this point of the game, I was just so focused on the Elite Four. Instead of going all the way back, I challenged the next veteran, and her Glaceon and Snorlax go down pretty easily, affirming my bad habit. The last veteran leads with a Skarmory who is easily dealt with by Temper, but Alakazam scares me to death, and I need Temper for the Elite Four. Since we didn't get the one shot with Fly, I switched to Shiny Zynus on a Psychic. And then they reveal, and land, Focus Blast. Ugh, yikes. It's easy enough to clean up the fight, but these were the sixth Pokemon I planned on bringing for the Elite Four. For no good reason, this difficult endgame just got way more difficult. I do some thinking and put together the new final team. This ends up being Helix Midnight, Winkbed, Zynus Green Tea, Temper, Nectar, and Aurora Luxe. I'll be continuing the same rules as before and only bring four Pokemon to match each Elite Four member's Pokemon count. I technically still have all six on the team, but I'm committing with the overlay. This final bit was never going to be easy, and I definitely shot myself in the foot by being careless, but we've made it this far. It's time to see if a group of Pokemon caught in Pokemon Sleep have what it takes to beat the Elite Four. I choose Malva as my first fight because I think I'm the most prepared for her. Winkbed leads and gets crit by Hyper Voice immediately before taking down her lead. Fortunately, the crit doesn't matter too much, because we still live in Earthquake from the following Torkoal. They then get low enough to waste both her potions, and Winkbed outspeeds to kill right after. At this point I realized I probably should have put on Protect and ran the Leftovers strat, but sadly it's a little late for that. With Chandelure next, I know Winkbed would get killed here, and switch to Helix Midnight. She takes the attacks just enough to retaliate with a Power Gem that doesn't quite get the kill. We could stay in and get the kill after living a non-crit, but it'd actually be better to switch in Temper and have her ready for the Talonflame. On the switch, she eats a Flamethrower, but is free to return the hit with a Dragon Claw that gets the kill. Talonflame is apparently very upset by the results of the previous matchups, because as soon as they enter the field, they launch a critical hit Brave Bird on Temper, knocking her out in a single blow. This is very bad. Temper was supposed to be the star of the Elite Four, and I honestly thought she was safe here. Rest in peace, Temper. It wasn't supposed to be this way. Zynus Green Tea takes Temper's place and was apparently super safe to a crit. First Surf finishes off the Talonflame and wins us the match. But I'm not celebrating right now. My only sure answer for Wickstrom and his Steel types, and one of my favorite Pokemon on the team, is gone. I really don't feel confident about this matchup, especially with the Aegis Slash. But I'm gonna challenge Wickstrom next. Well, I still have some Pokemon to battle him with. Winkbed is the lead and reminds us that she's no slouch by one-shotting the Clefki with a single Earthquake. Unfortunately, it's not before they set up one layer of spikes, but we'll take it. Provo Pass is next, and if it weren't for their Sturdy, we could easily take them out. We have Sturdy ourselves too, but I want to preserve Winkbed just in case, and switch to Nectar. Nectar easily eats all of their moves, and with the help of Synthesis, she's able to whittle them away with a barrage of energy balls. I do misclick and select Body Slam instead for return, so by the time Nectar takes them out, she's taken a little more damage than she should have. 
but she did also set up Reflect right before, which makes it really easy for Aurora to take on the Scissor. A couple Aura Spheres do the job, but right before Aegislash comes in, our Reflect wears off. I also should have fought Drasna right before this fight, because even if we could live a Sacred Sword, Dragon Pulse is our only move that could hit them. I haven't put on the Shadow Claw TM yet for that fight. At this point, I have no choice but to go to Zionist Green Tea, and luckily, they waste the turn going for a King Shield. But sadly, even while they're in attack form, our own attacks do very little. And Ice Beam doesn't freeze, so the fate of another one of my sleepy Pokemon has been sealed. This lets Nectar come in without taking a hit, and she somehow outspeeds the Aegislash and heals up with a Synthesis. She takes some heavy damage the same turn still, so we have no choice but to set up Reflect and hope she can live it. Regrettably, after the screen gets set up, the following Iron Head gets a crit, killing Nectar on the spot. She didn't deserve this, but her sacrifice lets Winkbed come back in. The spikes negate our sturdy ability, but thanks to the Reflect, Winkbed can easily live an Iron Head and fires off another Earthquake, handily obliterating the Sentient Sword. Here. I'll admit it, this has gone way worse than I could have imagined, and it's mostly my fault. At the worst part of the journey to do so, I got careless, and that cost me the lives of five incredible sleeping buddy mm, incre mm, Pokemon. It's time I wake up, because if I don't, then my remaining Pokemon won't be able to again. Finally, I challenge Drasna, and Winkbed is once again the lead. She's been doing amazing so far, and this fight isn't any different because she outspeeds and one-shots the Dragology before they can use Surf. Dredagon is next, but since it always goes for revenge, we're sure to outspeed and get some damage with Earthquake. When they do launch the revenge, Winkbed takes it like a champ and lives. This lets her follow up with another kill, even after they heal. Altaria comes out, and we can't afford to switch. When we decide to stay in, they just set up Cotton Guard, which is huge because the move we went for was Stone Edge, and the higher crit chance comes in clutch because it takes down Altaria through the plus three defense. Last is Noivern, and we really have no choice but to go for it again. They only have damage dealing moves, so Winkbed just has to be able to live one Dragon Pulse for a chance to land Stone Edge. When the Dragon Pulse lands on Winkbed, she lives with just a sliver and lands the Stone Edge after all. Oh, what are they feeding these things? Since I know for a fact Drasna's gonna heal, I lock in Stone Edge one more time, and Wink lands it. It doesn't get the crit, so they live, and they're for sure attacking this time. Now, instead of keeping Wink in, I switch to Aurora, who eats the Dragon Pulse with ease, and is free to take the kill with extreme speed. Winkbed, I'm sorry for ever doubting you. Oh my goodness. Last is Cybold, and his Pokemon aren't too tough to deal with, it's just that he has another Gyarados. But Helix gets the shine here, and when the battle starts, she's oddly fast enough to outspeed the Clawitzer and one-shot them with Thunderbolt. Gyarados wastes no time joining the fight, but in my experience fighting this guy, if they think I'll be scared and switch, they always use Dragon Dance. By keeping Helix in, I'm risking the Earthquake damage, but my prediction was correct, and they just used D-Dance after all. The following Thunderbolt is more than enough to get the kill, bringing in Barbaracle. Barbaracle outspeeds us to hit a Stone Edge that luckily doesn't crit, and our Thunderbolt brings them to what genuinely looks like one. We could stay in as is, since they're going to heal, but I want to get Aurora in safely before Starmie comes out. So once we switch, they do in fact heal, but it's all for naught as Aurora gets a believably easy one-shot with a close combat. Our defenses fell by one stage, but the Starmie plays it passive on the switch to set up a light screen for some reason. After getting hit by our Shadow Claw, the Starmie lands a Psychic that does about 80% and lowers our defenses again. But it's too late, because now Aurora just gets the kill with a second Shadow Claw, clearing out the last of the Elite Four. I got a little antsy switching in Aurora there, but we've got just one more fight to go. And I've never been more ready. Diantha leads with Hallucha, but since I'm leading with Helix, she poses very little threat. Especially when they lead with a resisted flying press. Okay, 
In return, Helix shoots off a Thunderbolt, one-shotting Diantha's lead. Next is Tyrantrum, and I'm honestly not expecting Helix to get out of this. With so few Pokemon remaining, I can't afford to make pivots. But Helix has been here from the very beginning, so she understands more than anyone that we need to prove that even Pokemon from Pokemon Sleep can fight. She stays in, and even though she won't get to Mega Evolve, her Dragon Pulse does huge damage into Tyrantrum, almost taking them out. They follow up with a monstrous Head Smash, and Helix holds on! The recoil damage ends up taking them out, leaving Gudra to come in. Helix seems to be holding on as long as possible, so I lean into that and lock in Thunder Wave. The Gudra sadly does outspeed, but Helix holds on again! After the Thunder Wave lands, we fire off another Dragon Pulse. And they get fully parried! The following Dragon Pulse then puts them in the red, and they fight through the paralysis to land their own Dragon Pulse, ending Helix's run. Rest in peace, Helix. You did amazing. Aurora now enters the fight, and with the perfect setup to boot. Since Diadma spends the turn healing, we Mega Evolve one last time and get a free power-up punch. After the boost, another one is just enough to take out Gudra. Diantha sends in Aurorus next, but all it does is feed our rising strength. She thinks she's got me with Gorgeist, but Shadow Claw more than does the job. Lash is Gardevoir, and even though it mega evolves, it's too late. Since Diantha played it so passive, Aurora got everything she needed to land a final, super effective Shadow Claw that easily knocks out the Mega Gardevoir, winning us not only the champion fight, but also the entire game. Woo, that was fun. See what you guys are missing out on by not playing Pokemon Sleep? Also, if you do play and need some more people on your friends list, feel free to add me. I've definitely gotten kind of sloppy with some of these runs, and I've recently noticed that I have zero deathless Nuzlocks, like on the YouTube channel or off. I'm gonna try to fix that lately because there, there was no reason for the end to be that tense. Anyways, if you enjoyed this video and want to support the channel, it'd mean a lot if you left a like, comment, and subscribe. But only if you mean it. Thank you again to the <coughs> member, and thank you all so much for watching, especially if you've made it to the end. I'll see you guys next time, and have a good one.